The megafauna project where we're studying whale sharks, manta rays and the Amura whale in the far north of the Great Barrier Reef has had a bit of a history. The project started when a local charity called Run for the Reef um, was raising money for marine research and they approached us and said we want to study whale sharks and we said you have to be kidding it's like looking for a needle in a haystack because we don't know where an aggregation of whale sharks is on the Great Barrier Reef and without an aggregation you can't really study it. So they insisted that they really wanted to do it so we basically got all this historical data of sightings and worked out that if we were going to find one it was likely at this place called Wreck Bay in the far northern Great Barrier Reef. The historical data and observations made by myself when I've been in the far north of the Great Barrier Reef for the last 25 years has led us to believe that there is a lot of biological activity around upwelling events. Upwelling events occur where the currents push the cold oceanic water from the depths up into the shallows of the Great Barrier Reef. And this brings with it a lot of food in the form of plankton, but also cooler waters. We all know that the Great Barrier Reef, like all coral reefs, is facing an uncertain future because of climate change. If we know when and where these upwelling events occur, it may allow us to identify parts of the Great Barrier Reef that may be more thermally tolerant to climate change. But because this is such a remote area, we actually need the animals, which know when and where these occur, to teach us about these events. Slattery Family Trust funded our first trip to the far north and found whale sharks. After the success of actually finding some whale sharks the first year, then we were funded by Blanc Payne to actually mount a proper expedition. And so we had planes in the air to look for the whale sharks. We had a liveboard vessel that could take uh, 16 people. Uh, we bought satellite tags for it. And most importantly, we were able to bring all these whale shark experts from around Australia really join the expedition. How it actually works to find the largest fish in the ocean exactly is actually funny because, I mean, you're talking about looking for a massive fish. Firstly, we have to have a plane in the air that's going around trying to spot the sharks. So it's just circling in these areas, looking and looking. Then, once they find one, they radio back to our boat and give us a heading and how far away we are from it. As we get close, Richard launches the drone. It always surprises me as a drone pilot as to how hard it is to get the drone above a whale shark. I mean, it's only the world's largest fish, but it is a big ocean and it takes a lot of coordination and communication between the spotter plane and me flying the drone. By then we've launched a tender with the research team in it and they're following the drone. So every time the shark moves and the drone's moving, we're trying to coordinate with them on the radio to get in front of the shark. Once that works and we're actually in front of the shark and it's on the surface still, the research team jumps in. First person is there to take the photo ID of the spots. Then the next person jumps in, puts on the clamp of the satellite tag. And if the shark is still there swimming along happily, then we try to get a genetic sample. And we also sometimes try to put an acoustic tag in them. It's a lot of work and a lot of coordination for it to go well. And sometimes you have a shark that stays on the surface for a long time and it's easy. Others, they seem to come up and then they dive again. So you're constantly looking for them. With a photo ID, there's a global database. So they have a few standards of how they actually take the photo. So the first thing they try to do is get the left-hand side. So it's the left-hand side around the gills. There's a certain triangle area which they look for. If they get the left-hand side first, then if they can end, they also get the right hand side. And the spots are like a fingerprint. So there's thousands of sharks in the global database and we can get an idea if the sharks that we, we have been taking pictures of and IDing actually come from other areas or not. So far not. Our primary tool to start the project is really using satellite tags. So a satellite tag is clamped onto the fin of a shark and as it breaks the surface, if there's satellites above, it'll give a location of where the shark is. Now, unfortunately in Queensland, we only have satellites above about 30% of the time. If we get a hit or two a week, we're pretty happy. These whale sharks sometimes are pinging in every day still. So they must be spending quite a bit of time on the surface. Now the clamps, we've been trying to use a four year battery life tag, which it's hard to hold on the clamps and the clamps actually fall off. So the first few sharks we tried, we only got a couple of months of data out of them, but the next batch we made, we improved it 
and we've managed to get a shark now that's been that's had a clamp on it for over a year, which I'm fairly sure is a world record for a clamp fin. Sort of movements we're getting, uh, they hang around the what we think is the aggregation site as we thought, sort of November, December, January. Getting these really big movements out into the Coral Sea and around and up. Quite a few of them have gone into Papua New Guinea, which they're actually moving through areas where they're vulnerable to fishing. Ali the whale shark is the star. It's been on for, well, it's about 14 months now, and she's done big circles of the Coral Sea, came back to the aggregation exactly at the time the year after. So she's showing that it is an annual aggregation that they come back to. She stayed there again for like November, December-ish, January, as we thought she would, and then she's gone off again, doing big circles of the Coral Sea again. So this is the first shark to actually show the pattern of what we think is happening. Other whale shark researchers are quite excited about our aggregation for two reasons really. One, that area is a massive black hole in understanding the actual global population and how the Asia and Pacific moves together. So is it a separate population? Is it feeding into other ones, etc., etc., like that? The other exciting thing is most whale shark aggregations around the world are juvenile males. There is a couple of exceptions where, where they've got big females, only a few. Our aggregation so far is showing it's mixed. We've got juvenile males, juvenile females, and adults as well. So it's a mixed aggregation, which a lot of them are very, very excited about because we can have the opportunity to not just study the juvenile males, but the look at what the females are doing as well and the larger adults. Apart from the whale sharks, we're actually looking for manta rays as well. So there's been a lot of research on manta rays in Queensland and the east coast of Australia, but it's all down south. There's been a lot of stuff down there. They, we don't really know what's going on in the northern part of Queensland because one, again, we can't find in aggregations. They normally ag aggregate at cleaning stations or at productive sites to feed. So without finding where they are, again, it's, it's hard to actually study them. So we've been looking for manta rays as well. And we managed to tag the first manta rays in the north of Queensland on our last trip. So it's not just whale sharks that we're finding in the Rec Bay area. We're seeing oceanic manta rays, reef manta rays, mobile arrays, a lot of different cetaceans around, including this one whale that we've been chasing, or I have been chasing for over 25 years, which has now been positively identified as the Amuru's whale. We've had special permits, so I've been able to fly very close to the whale to get the identification markings needed by the expert to identify what they are. It's not just that the Amura whales are there, we know there's other activity happening. We're seeing mothers with calves, we're seeing the whales coming up from the depths of their baleen plates extended, which means they've been feeding down there as well. And we also got a unique opportunity to see them feeding on the surface. And without drones, we would never be able to get close to these animals. So our Mega Mouth project has only just started. We know now that there's a lot happening and we know that the animals are returning. So we need to expand to look at what's happening in the whole ecosystem and what is driving uh, these upwelling events. We need to take oceanographic people to look at the currents, plankton experts to work out what they're doing, high technology people so we can put robots down to see where these animals are feeding down deep, even putting cameras on the back of these sharks so we can see their behavior, when they're feeding, when they're not feeding, and any possible social interactions are happening. So it's a very exciting project that we're very much looking forward on to discovering new things into the future.